Hi. Um, I now want to welcome uh, Mathangi Shri, who I've always said personally is one of my favorite people whenever I hear her speak. It's always a delight. And uh, Mathangi is going to be speaking on what is being data driven. Uh, she is the chief data officer at UB, which was formerly Cred Avenue, uh, and has recently published a book called The Practical Natural Language Processing with Python. Uh, she has almost two decades of a proven track record in building world-class data science solutions and products, 20 patent grants in the area of intuitive customer experience and user profiles. And she has built data science teams for organizations such as Gojek, Citibank, HSBC, and GE, as well as for tech startups like 24-7 AI and PhonePay. <clears throat> She's also guest faculty in many premium institutes across the country, such as IIIT, Sri City, I am Kashipur and IT Trichy, and among others, and has been recognized as one of the phenomenal she by Indian National Bar Association in 2019, top 50 influential AI leaders in India by Analytics India Magazine in 21, and one of the top AI leaders in India 21 by 3 AI Association. Mathangi, all yours. Uh, we'll take questions. Um, I'm just telling, um, reminding everyone again, we'll take questions to the Slido link, please. If you could share your questions for Mathangi at the end oh. of it. By the way, all of our speakers, please listen to them carefully so that next time when you need to apply for a job at their companies, you can say, hey, I, you know, listen to that talk of yours. And there's this really sharp question. So can I apply for uh, uh, this position? So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you <have> a tip. <laughs> the introduction, um, you know, glad to meet um, all of you on the UNIV AI team. So, yes, yeah, so I will get uh, started. So this is a topic very close to my heart. It's called uh, data-driven decisions. Um, and if people ask me what I do, I do say that, you know, I enable data-driven decisions in the organization, right? So um, democratizing data and making companies AI-led um, has been the core principle, um, uh, you know, at least for the last uh, few years where I've been uh, leading large charters in AI. Uh, so with that uh, note, I would like to, uh, you know, dwell into this topic. So I'm trying to share my screen. Uh, my screen visible, right? Sorry, yes, it is. <laughs> yeah. So different people, it can mean different things to different people, uh, data-driven decisions. Okay, so um, I want to take a very structural approach to this and what we mean by, uh, you know, data-driven decisions and how it is used, how it is being practiced, how it was pra practiced earlier. So with that note, I would like to start with a little bit of history on data-driven decisions, right? So this is very, very long back. So I'm taking reference from Arthashastra. And um, we're collecting data for better administration and governance was there um, in the text. Uh, there's a link I have given, um, uh, you know, on the right side of the slide where, uh, you know, you can get a full view of uh, different parts of Arthashastra. But this is something that I resonated with me where uh, data was used for administration and governance or advised to use for administration and governance. Um, and there was also a distinction in this text made between intuition and the power of using empirical data, right, for taking decisions. Um, and how do you extract information from raw data? So the text also dif differentiates the difference between information and raw data. And data as an input to political strategic planning was discussed um, in the text long back. Like I said, uh, you could you could go uh, to the YouTube video and uh, listen more about it. But uh, the reason I put this slide out here is data is very, very old, uh, if not as older as languages, but it is fairly older than what we think it is. Uh, not only data, data-driven decisions are very, very long, right? Uh, so from there, we cut to the modern story. It starts with a society called Manchester Garden Society in 1826. So what they did was, so this was a uh, uh, you know, a, a bank kind of uh, entity, which was kind of releasing news reports about defaulters, uh, you know, in their, uh, uh, in you know, so to say, in their bank, right? So they used to publish this so that group of other banks would know about defaulters and can um, not lend to them and hence, um, you know, save on their losses. So that was the idea of it. So this Manchester Garden Society, um, you know, still exists today. So the modern uh, day of this is called experience. So that's the, uh, you know, backstory of uh, Manchester Garden Society. 
Now, from there, we move to a little bit more recent history than 1826. Uh, the reason um, I put the 1826 uh, version is possibly we can we could uh, relate a lot to the modern usage of statistics. Uh, you know, genesis to be part of that Man Manchester Garden Society. Uh, now we'll talk about what happened in that era, right? So I would like to broadly divide data-driven decisions into two phases, right? And these two phases are very different from each other. One is data-backed human decisions, right? So humans, when making decisions, data was is used more as a support system to validate or not validate decisions. Um, so these are some of the questions that people were handling. Exhibits a phenomenon or not? Uh, you know, we try to understand why certain thing is happening and why certain things are not happening. These are more actionable recommendations. Um, you know, uh, around the 2000s, this word was very popular in companies. Um, what is called as actionable recommendations, uh, where you analyze data, you do a bunch of bivariate flaws, you do a bunch of statistical analysis, and you come out with something that the company can be useful about. And then there was also, uh, you know, the phase where design of experiments became, um, uh, you know, a, a field in itself, especially started from the manufacturing uh, scene where uh, different uh, machines have to be set for different configurations. What is the right configuration to achieve the best quality was a general problem statement for which a huge area of um, statistics came into existence is called design of experiments. So rather than inferencing post experiment on, uh, you know, what could have happened, we set up the experiments to do better inferencing, right? So those were clinical trials is another area where um, a lot of uh, statistics and the mathematical models were used, right? But in all of this, the common theme is a risk manager or a marketing manager or um, a CEO of a company would put out certain hypothesis. So they would ha have an understanding about the market. They would have an understanding about the segment that they want to serve, uh, or they would have an understanding about, um, you know, certain sets of uh, you know, let's say drugs that they want to test, etc. Right. So all of this is already generated, so to say, by human intuition, and data is collected to validate or invalidate the hypothesis. To to go to uh, very explainable levels, at the end of it, all the data uh, teams' uh, work resided fundamentally within a presentation. Right. So and then in the presentation, you recommend something. Whether somebody takes it or not is up to them. Um, sometimes it is always possible that whatever data set is already known to them and they were just looking at one more validation to kind of make their point and get their way across. Um, or sometimes data came up, even if data came up with a pattern completely, um, you know, unknown to them, then there were a lot of questions and, uh, you know, sub questions asked uh, before that hypothesis was built. So you can understand this was a very static phase of using data. We do still use, so the analytics teams largely um, does a lot of these things, but those days only this existed uh, where, uh, uh, you know, data was very static um, and sta uh, st static recommendations and static insights were provided. Attribution was missing, right? So a data team cannot really claim they made a business impact because there's not a clear way to attribute um, uh, you know, whatever we said actually impacted in a certain decision within the business, right? So this was the world of statistics and, uh, you know, causal inference. So causal inference also became an um, important thing then. Uh, like uh, we saw a certain phenomena, we want to understand uh, why the sales increased or why the sales decreased or why, um, yeah, you know, certain at certain temperature uh, settings, you know, certain quality output comes in, etc. Right. So there were there were a bunch of experiments. They were understanding on. Uh, there was a lot of attempt made to understand underlying data behavior, and there were certain validations for which data was used. They did they did make an make an impact. It is not to say that they were not making impact. They did make an impact, but it was extremely restricted. Right. So, uh, you know, from here, we I can give you an example of even the decision trees, the way it was uh, built, right? So these are not your ensemble decision trees that, you, that happens today completely data-driven. This is more human 
you know human guided decision tree where uh, the machine was only you know, providing a split that was statistically significant or not right so and even here uh, when we used to build these models um, suppose um, certain things are not making sense right so for example um, if age greater than 30 has a higher default rate than age less than um, uh, 30 right then the question is about whether that is right whether that is intuitive enough you put a lot of intuition in believing uh, even a statistical output so that was that era of very static um, generation of data where it was more um, you know human led and data assisted so what changed right so the world we live in today is very different uh, from that world so what i would like to call this world as is data led human governed uh, uh, you know phase right and what is data led human governed phase we are setting up certain algorithms we are um, kind of enabling the algorithms to learn but beyond that we are taking humans are taking data scientists are taking a back step for the data to find out the hypothesis patterns and take decisions and these are fundamentally micro decisions at scale right so it could be your uber that you booked and then the your trip is getting assigned to the right driver right or a right pricing is happening all of this are happening um, at scale across different users across different drivers in the example that i said right across multiple actors multiple decisions are made multiple types of decisions are made today so it's very very different from the world of static decisioning that happened a while ago right so now what what made why did this change happen right so it happened on, in my uh, opinion in, in three dimensions because of three dimensions one data itself grew very much because there was a lot of um, you know, burst of consumer companies, the likes of Amazon, uh, Netflix, etc., started collecting data, large scale data. And then there was also a fundamental growth in computing power, which is a very important, uh, uh, you know, reason uh, that uh, we, we were able to shift from the world of static statistics to more dynamic computer science um, is because of the ad advancement in the compute power, right? Which compute power became much more cheaper that organizations could afford it. The third important leg not to be forgotten is science, which is the algorithms. However, interestingly, the algorithms, um, you know, started well before uh, the computer science era, right? So, or the usage of so computer science and commercial applications. So um, the algorithm started possibly, you know, we hear of the earlier NLP algorithms happening in the 1950s. Um, we have the initial deep learning models coming up in 1970s, et cetera, right? So the algorithms were always around data was missing at scale to test these algorithms compute power was missing so when both of this came together the existing algorithms got got picked up um, you know got dusted and got picked up and then we have an evolution of a uh, state of statistics to computer science right so this changed the entire game uh, of uh, you know data led decisions now data is truly at the forefront not where it was earlier like you know behind the scenes and um, you know used only as a post exercise than uh, data running the show. So from here, we are um, talking a lot about ma machine learning, right? And we have machine learning today penetrating across the customer life cycle. So if I were to divide the customer life cycle into acquire, manage, and retain, we have um, machine learning models across this uh, chain, right? So, and uh, for example, for targeting, whom to target, when to target, um, you know, what to target with them, what kind of content to send, is there a location-based thing so that uh, it's also about where to target or on a website, which web, pa web page to um, show an ad to a customer, for example, or which, app, which kind of app notification we should show, you know, and who are the right users and for which users, what kind of, um, you know, messages to say, which is personalization. So we have gone um, to an era of explosion where literally the end across the life cycle of the customer, um, at every touch point, there are data science models and machine learning uh, powering those. The rest of the talk is going to be um, those use cases and we will go a little bit, um, you know, deeper on those use cases. I'll highlight some of the use cases across, um, you know, various uh, domains, right? 
we if you just divide life cycle into acquire right so during the time we a company acquires a customer your targeting models you know what is also called as the uplift models for example where you want to spend the right amount of budget to acquire the right customer so that you, you can reduce the customer acquisition cost um data science powers almost that entire um, uh, chain of uh, growth for a company then manage is where your customer life cycle happens so very advanced organizations today use um advanced customer life cycle models which kind of computes on day zero what is your estimated um you know day day 360 um you know out, uh, returns from that customer and hence how much marketing budget we should spend towards the customer at a customer level and not at a segment level right so that's about manage and also of course you know during this phase we also dis- make the customer discover multiple products not only we make the customer go deep uh, you know uh, in a product making the customer buy more but also buying across like right? trying different products um, making that customer more loyal bringing them bringing their friends and network into the product etc in all of that um, in many advanced um, you know tech and digital first organizations data science plays a critical role in it um, and some of this manage extends to retain because when you as you spread your products to different customers as you figure out you know at what point in time their engagement dips and then re-engage with them right so all of those are powered uh, together by solid uh, you know machine learning models so i would like to start because we started this whole history with banking with the manchester garden society we are also going to start this machine learning thing surprisingly from banking right so one of the oldest industries out there and uh, supposed to be very traditional bureaucratic um, you know not making decisions faster etc are one of the powerhouses for um, using data powerhouses for generating data using data building algorithms and prime state of the art stuff continues to be banking right uh, despite all the startups and all the ecosystem that is growing banking is one of the uh, you know biggest consumers as well as biggest uh, generators of um, you know algorithms and data science models right? so of course uh, we cannot talk uh, banking without addressing credit and fraud risk this area is uh, very well researched uh, very well understood at this point in time there are credit risk scores that is coming out from uh you know federated bodies like the bureaus but each bank uh, or each financial institution have their own credit risk score um have their own understanding of credit risk and these are your solid deep learning models etc that's getting used fraud is another area is also well understood with all a lot of work on anomaly detection and um you know patterns that does not require supervised learning but can um you know figure out uh, outliers on the go etc so there's a lot of work on um you know fraud as well and marketing is another area where you know people send out campaigns so earlier these were mailers and physical papers that got sent out but now it's more you know whatsapp uh, your ivr calls your voice bots uh, email uh, emails and smss etc so uh, which customer to target when to target what uh, and the when can get as granular at an hour level uh, what content to um, you know uh, give them and which channel to target them all of that at a personalized level right so the if the earlier era we were looking at more at a segment level here it is more at a personalized level um, you know marketing is being done pricing is another area where banks are trying to get into but the best amount of um, you know micro level decisions and pricing happens more in hyper local companies we'll talk about it later but banks also do um, enough of their experiments in pricing in determining the interest rates etc again at a customer level um, and uh, managing premium customers is another upcoming area where a relationship manager talks to a customer so can there be bots and can those conversations be mined can the conversations be guided you know your upsell and cross sell recommendations at a relationship manager cross user level retail uh, this is another traditional industry but this is kind of getting a makeover i would say digitally and because it's a makeover digitally data also plays a um, you know critical role in it of course uh, uh, companies like walmart have huge forecasting teams uh which forecast at a sku level uh, across different stores on how much they should stock etc so they've been traditionally using analytics to run um, you know retail shop beat and supply chain uh, area etc but what is the new thing here is something called as an aisle tracking where um, you try to put cameras and see how the user goes and as the user goes can you put the right notification at the right point in time in order to induce the user to buy um, you know certain things that they wouldn't have you know bought all of you would have heard about amazon go 
where you can self serve and all of your purchases is kind of digitally tracked um, and hence that inherently powers um, you know their recommendations the next time you visit the store or your push notification or your mailers um, you know or campaigns marketing campaigns etc that comes to the store of course it powers the logistics and the inventory management uh, a bit of it on how much to stock at what point to stock etc e-commerce uh, if there is a you know traditionally um, a company which is very native to data e-commerce is banking and retail is not those but e-commerce is everything in e-commerce is uh, native to data right so um, every by by the nature of the business uh, you collect data as the uh, is as the journey of the user proceeds so everything is recorded everything is instrumented we talked about large size computing power and this is where it's ne- needed in uh, e-commerce core thing i would like to highlight here is on the recommendation and search bit which which powers um, a lot of uh, the company uh, the company's revenues right any company's revenue powered by uh, search and recommendations uh, based on search has become extremely personalized so we have moved from a world of only elastic search based uh, results uh, to extremely personalized results so it's not about if you type apple um i will show you products that contains the word apple or the fruit apple but actually i can show you depending on the kind of user you are if you have purchased a lot of gadgets in the past and if you are a person who keeps um you know browsing on apple products etc when you type apple for you the results should be ideally mac products uh, whereas when um, when let us say somebody who is kind of using for grocery shopping and the person types apple then um, you show a lot of uh, grocery items right and it is very important to be bang on with the with the search and what we kind of call a semantic search uh, which is uh, not only what i typed but actually what i meant um, again there are two parts to it where i uh, the meaning of the word generally um, like apple for example is understood today it could mean a class of uh, gadgets or it could mean a fruit or it could um, uh, you know it could mean a company however um, that is semantic results right but it can also get personalized so if i type apple what results you will show to somebody else types apple what it should show so we are at that stage with respect to uh, search and recommendation algorithms where um we are not only looking at uh, context of the word uh, and only subjecting it to natural language processing but we have gone far further from that and make the results search very personalized to all the journey and what the user saw in the last 5 minutes uh, to what their history in the last 6 months where what kind of user they are you know what kind of uh, you know purchase pattern that they have what kind of family if, if we collect those details also if you see some of the shopping websites today collect whom have you shopped this for so if that information is also available then the results can get even more personalized so we are at that uh, uh, stage of uh, really personalized um, you know search result uh, personalized uh, for that user at that point in time right? so um fabric discovery is another interesting area where uh, based on computer vision um you know you are kind of um, using the merchandise the company kind of recognizes that fabric automatically without the merchants having to enter what kind of fabric it is and depending on the user's uh, purchase history of a certain fabric you kind of recommend um, certain design and style on that fabric right so fabric discovery is also another area um, e-commerce we cannot uh, stop talking about review mining that's another um, area where natural language processing plays an important role because with the every purchase happens because of reviews and it is very important to know whether a review is genuine or not and and for that uh, a lot of a lot of research also has happened on it um, there are uh, cues on when there is a fake review what kind of uh, for example right uh, it is said that for fake reviews people do a lot of scene setting like they they give you a lot of context right i have this family and i have come to this hotel and we came here for vacation so on and so forth whereas a genuine user is bang on to the point on what worked for them and what not worked for them this is this is from one of the research a very famous research on the area of uh, review mining so review mining continues to be a core um, one to extract different topics uh, for the website for the users to understand the product if there are 500 reviews you summarize them quickly in few pills and show it to the user and also to detect 
um, you know what the user uh, which are the fraud fraud users review and which are not fraud reviews right so and um, the, those are some of just the tip of the iceberg use cases e-commerce is a lot more like i said forecasting is a huge area again in e-commerce because you want to um, forecast for that sku at that point in time um, and also especially when it comes to mobile phones um, kind of product which is extremely seasonal and then you are forecasting for a product like that uh, presents its own challenges on demand deliveries these are your hyper local things so i briefly touched on it when i talked about you know pricing uh, the, so on demand deliveries is your typical you know zepto blinkit uh, swiggy kind of things and uh, the entire journey of the customer runs on uh, machine learning models for example uh, figuring out uh, you ordered something when is that order going to come in especially in the case of food where companies are um, you know, trying to beat it real time uh, as much as close as possible uh, to when the food will get delivered, right? So you have you have a window. If let's say average delivery time is uh, forty to forty five minutes, right? Um, you have only uh, you know so much window to kind of go wrong when it. So forty five minutes order, you can't say uh, you know let's say fifty five minutes. It's a big difference because if you say um, uh, you know, such an inaccurate prediction, which is just 10 minutes more, um, it's very much possible that the user drops off and not ordering the food. And there is competition from the home kitchen as well. Like you can actually prepare the food or you can go to another competitor app and order the food or you can directly call the restaurant and order the food, right? So um, the sensitivity to errors are very high uh, in hyperlocal uh, deliveries. And one such example is um, about predicting the time of arrival of the product ordered. Uh, again, Again, sensitivity is further high when it comes to food um, and um, there is real-time routing because uh, normally on-demand deliveries have uh, you know three uh, sorts of players uh, to uh, satisfy one is the customers the other is the drivers the other are the merchants right so none of these three players are controlled directly by the company right so they are all coming willingly to the platform and their communities to match and manage and hence it's very important and these are large communities right your customer base bases in millions your or um, drivers uh, is in uh, you know tens of thousands and then uh, you have your merchants which is again in tens of thousands range so you need to satisfy all the three so for example if it's a pricing algorithm that is working for a food delivery app uh, the customer should be willing to pay the money the uh, uh, delivery fee that the driver is willing to accept to come to your place to deliver it and again all of this is happening uh, at microseconds behind the scene across different orders across different customers and across different drivers and hence machine learning kind of um, you know plays an important role here uh, recommendations for food uh, normally when you open a food delivery app they actually show you you know what are the top uh, recommended ones for you that actually makes or breaks your purchase so uh, there also it plays an um, you know kind of very important role i'm just doing a time check okay um, customer service uh, you know this was one possibly the last industry that adopted you know machine learning um, here Bots are bots came up, bots went off, bots are again coming up. Uh, so there is a lot of work that is happening at this point in time, actively taking away customer calls, uh, uh, customer call support, like human assisted call support to bots um, assisted call support, uh, powered by um, you know chat and voice bots, agent routing, which agent to route it depending on the issue of the customer, etc. So some of these are um, you know when I started working in the field, uh, just on the customer service field, it was easily more than ten years back. And we were trying to build bots, et cetera, uh, which was for the US market. But even in India today, I can vouch for it that a lot of companies are adopting it. Uh, some of the things like agent routing or agent mining is becoming just the norm any organization um, you know, is run. Um, healthcare is another area, another huge area. I have not done any justice by putting only these three or four things here. Uh, so claim management, right, in insurance, uh, you know, when you submit a claim, whether it is a genuine claim, not a genuine claim, document parsing, computer vision, on a lot of that, um, uh, you know, is powered by A and ML. Uh, determining premium is also a very important one uh, because your premium is not just determined by your age. If you talk to insurance people, they'll tell you it's fundamentally a function of your lifestyle, right? Because different lifestyles have a um, you know, different uh, survival ratios, right? So people who have a certain lifestyle, certain healthy lifestyle live longer than um, people, um, you know, with a certain type of lifestyle. So age is lesser a determinant, lifestyle is more a determinant of 
um, you know, how many um, health issues you are going to have, right? And hence the premium kind of goes up or down based on that. And for lifestyle, one of the indexing variables um, is income. So predicting somebody's income without them explicitly declaring is another area that insurance company actively solve on. Um, this is more example like, you know, online uh, on demand doctor appointments where you are matching the best doctor for the be best patients and kind of, uh, uh, you know, assign uh, an assignment problem. Uh, it's also a problem of uh, going through the entire text of what the doctor does well and their reviews, etc. to determine what does the doctor actually specialize in and hence for a certain ailment, whether this doctor will provide the right solution or not. Entertainment, again, we are kind of filled with this as we open our Netflix app or YouTube app. Um, you know, a lot of video content mining is becoming the norm of the day. It is uh, not only the tags that go with the videos that gets mined, but actually is frame by frame of the video itself get mined. Um, I think we are not um, far from a time where um, like book that can be generated through natural language generation. I think videos could also be um, generated through image generation techniques. So we possibly we are not far from the day where a movie can be made just for you. With that note, I am kind of closing my presentation. Would love to answer questions. Uh, thank you so much, Matangi. I'm going to pass the, the baton to uh, Siddharth, who is going to take the questions. So Matangi, I asked the same question to the previous speaker that We've got uh, a bunch of students here, right, who can't necessarily relate uh, to something that they haven't yet done, right? So, <clears throat> so what do you say about everything that you've covered is most exciting from a career point of view, right? Some, so, and, and let me give you a second layer of questions uh, or another layer of question to parse before you get to your actual answer, that, that it so happens that we hear about these super exciting problems to work on. Yeah, none of the jobs, however, have the problems for you to work on them. Okay, almost none of them. And and this I'm saying uh, firsthand after having to talk to folks, ninety to hundred people like you are hiring for these jobs, right? So and then compare and contrast. I just do a casual LinkedIn search in the United States uh, to see staggering number of serious data science jobs, right? And uh, the the search unearths 400,000 or close to. But let's, you know, even after you pass through things like repos, repos that have been around for a long time, blah, blah, still it's a couple of hundred thousand. Yeah. So so beneath the hype and the potential, the potential is real. You and I know it. What gives? What? Right? Sorry. I think that's probably of, huh? No, I missed that last bit. Uh, beneath no, I said, what gives? Like, what's missing from the reality of an aspiring data science scientist's life that doesn't deliver on the excitement and the promise? Okay, one thing I want to clarify, right? Uh, a lot of these, uh, either I have worked on, um, especially on the on-demand delivery slide, that's completely my projects um, that mine has worked on in India. Uh, and uh, the banking problems that I've worked on, I put there. Retail, I've heard uh, you know these jobs and heard my colleagues working on it. That's where the retail comes. So, Almost uh, all of them that I have put um, is coming from firsthand source on uh, either good chunk of it, like 60% of it are something that I've worked on, right? A um, 40% of it is coming from people I know who have worked on it, right? So mm -hmm. these, whatever I put it, it's, it's completely out there in India, right? My experience has always been in India, except for a very few yeah. students. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so these jobs exist in India. So that's what I want to say. Of course, mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, number of as a percentage of uh, data science jobs that people put it to how much of this is real. So that can vary. Uh, but these two things are, uh, you know, happening and much more than what it is. Uh, you know, even yesterday I was having a chat on video analytics with someone. Right. So um, this is not surreal. Right. This is really real. Whatever um, is there. Um, but however, so one way, um, uh, you know, however the market is and what is the, whatever is the percentage of jobs out there to really those jobs who do it, I, uh, people especially who are excited to work on the space uh, can do few of these, right? A uh, few of these uh, to filter out things that they're looking for. Right? So to go during your interviews a little deeper, looking for very product uh, kind of companies where some of these actually happen and, uh, yeah, so and, and possibly that's that is some starting point for uh, people to really work on cutting edge stuff. 
Um, the other thing is, um, uh, you know, some of these, especially I put the slide on banking with a lot of reason, because a lot of people think that not good things happen in bank, right? So there are teams, very dedicated teams, if you can crack those teams in bank, um, you get to do um, extremely cutting edge stuff. Okay. So that that would be my answer. Uh, uh, of course, there are jobs that fake fake data science in the market, which is very which is very wrong and sad to see, because you should call a data science role only if it does data science at the end of it. So do you think? I mean, do you, so I know that you you said that yes, these jobs exist, and I think I agree that these jobs exist. What is what do you think quantitatively is the number of such opportunities in the country? Is it high, do you think, or is it somewhat limited? I would say it's limited. It's, it's largely limited. Okay, so where does it happen? Let me answer without the number, right? Because I don't know the number. I would rather uh, answer it like this. Where does these jobs exist? I can answer that question, right? So okay, it, exists in, it exists in product companies. It exists in banks, which are uh, your offshore center of, let's say, uh, US uh, or some of the advanced markets on this, right? Um, mm -hmm. It exists in um, uh, some of the niche startups that is uh, that is there. Um, it, uh, for example, Walmart Labs, you know, does a lot of work on um, you know forecasting, and that's where my forecasting example comes from. I know the team size there at forecasting, etc. Right? So, um, the the offshore companies where their U.S. counterparts are very advanced have, have that. Product companies definitely do it, but the number of such roles in product companies is limited to get into a data science team. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, those would be my two, some of the service companies and certain teams in service, analytic service companies does this. And, and would you say that uh, the kind of stuff that people get excited by, like for example, self-driving, yeah? Yeah. The, the right approach to getting access to work on things like that is actually to pursue graduate school uh, or, or can one get into sort of that caliber of executed AI kind of project uh, in, in an industrial situation easily. See, it's interesting. Like uh, I went to IITM uh, research center two days or three days back, right? To see what is, and there's a lot of work that's happening there in uh, self-driving and these are companies incubated in uh, the research center. Um, so, and uh, but interestingly, I was having a chat with um, Dr. Ashok Junjunwala, right? So he's a, um, he's been a pioneer for a lot of things in India. And he was saying that the talent that is required to build it is not, need not be from tier one institutes in India. So there can be anybody who can be molded into this kind of uh, thinking with good amount of training, people can get into these spaces and they are getting into it. So it's, it's a real life use case I saw. But, but I, I was more specifically asking that is academics for people who really, really want to be doing exciting stuff here, if industry isn't yielding the right alternatives, is, is higher studies another place to go to? Possibly, yes, right. but I would still believe industry is doing mm -hmm. some of this stuff. Enough, okay. So which means I think there is an opportunity here to reveal what the industry is doing because it's not easily visible, right? Like job posts don't Absolutely. say it, job posts misrepresent stuff. So I think for us to go through through folks like yourselves who know what's what's happening around maybe it's a it's a network externality job that people like me go hunt around ask people and find out where the real stuff is getting done right absolutely so i'll i'll give you my example at ub right so mm -hmm. uh, when i started this team like when i joined like 7 months back uh, there were barely any machine learning being done there. But uh, now we are doing really state-of-the-art models. We are com our computer vision team is uh, really uh, certain, certain things we are solving are multi-page document parsers, uh, multi-page for invoices and things like that. We are working on vernacular bots. Uh, we have our live prototype ready, waiting for it to go live on vernacular, right? not just English. So English is maybe a little bit of solved problem. On conversational AI, we are we are investing there, invest uh, heavily there. We are also uh, very much invested in um, explainability in AI, which is which is an upcoming uh, uh, field. So it is there. These opportunities are um, you know are there. Maybe you are right. Um, the knowledge about these opportunities are not well known. At some levels, you know these are not your regular uh, you know factory kind of jobs that you get out there they are also limited uh, to startups and limited to product companies li limited to visionary founders etc fair no and and that's lovely to hear i wanted you to validate that 
the dream that people see when they get to study machine learning plus, right? It exists and it doesn't need to be crushed in the misinformation that's out there. And there's a lot of misinformation out there, right? In the employment market. Uh, yeah, I agree. A lot of misinformation is there, but these opportunities are real. I am living and breathing that day in, day out. All right. So you know that I'm going to bother you, right? <laughs> <laughs> Offline. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's what this was leading. Yeah. <laughs> so on that note, thanks, Atan. I didn't ask you anything about what you actually talked about, but but I know that all of these guys, you know, hear these wonderful things and then go on to work on it. Okay. And I think one of the things that we can do for most people here is that get them to be able to doing these amazing stuff. And on that note, I think uh, Selish, who's already here, is also doing some amazing stuff at Geo. So let's find out from him. Sure. So thank, thanks, Atan Ma. Thank, thank you for sparing your time. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye.